This is the Wealth Standard Podcast, the gold standard in all things financial. Hi, everyone. This is Patrick Donahoe. Welcome to the Wealth Standard Radio. And this is episode 185, and it is the second part of the psychology of money. And I have my now good friend, Matt Woolley, Dr. Matt Woolley, with me. Matt, welcome back. Thanks for having me back. And for those that uh, that didn't know, we we are uh, we, we record video, so you can check out all of our stuff on uh, Facebook or on our YouTube channel. Uh, and then we're going to include a lot of resources in our show notes. So definitely get onto that page. It's thewealthstandard.com. All right, Matt. Well, we scratched the surface last time. Yeah, okay, lots so, to talk about. Yeah. So today we're gonna you know we diagnosed the you know the psychology of money or dissected it, I guess you can say and you know, this, how do people view money? You know, what, what motivates them? Uh, and today we're going to get into really, you know, when everything collapses, when, you know, there, when you approach the primary anxieties that people have, which is typically loss, right? Loss right. of, uh, you know, financial yeah. resources or something. Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, how to prepare for that uh, right now and what that can essentially tell you about what your psychology of money is. Once you actually start to ask yourself questions of, Okay, you know, I. What's the worst that can happen, right? Well, let's say yeah. you lost. Let's say you. Lo- I ask some. You know, I. I like to ask people like, what if you, what if you know the doors close tomorrow? What if this happened or what if this happened? What would you do? And I ask yeah. my. I like to ask my my kid my kids that, and they're younger, so they they already think <laughs> I'm crazy. But you ask them like, it's like, okay, you lost your phone, right? You lost your iPad. You lost, yeah. you know, your shirt. It's like, it's okay. Right? Well, it's that's okay, a great it's okay. thing. It's actually a great thing to ask your kids because, as you know, I'm sure you're training abstract logical reasoning. <laughs> you're having them take an abstract concept, I've never said break that, it down. I will definitely remember that one. Oh, they won't listen that. to you if you use that at home. They'll be like, <laughs> I'm totally checking out on dad. But you're training, you're, you're, that's brain training. That's good dad brain training. You're yep. a good dad coach because yep. you're training them to think about the what ifs. And that absolutely, if you start that young with things like, you know, if you don't make the basketball team, if you lose your cell phone, if you get an F on a test you thought you'd get an A on, what will you do? How will it affect you? That's Those are the exact same thinking skills that we as adults need to have to deal with exactly what you're talking about, which is what if this security, this money that I make, what if it goes away? What if it stops? What if the what if the well dries up? What am I going to do? Yeah. Well, I think it's it, it's it's really two parts to that because I would say that looking at where you're at right now is a function of the value you've created. Okay. Sure. Whether it's your education or your personality or books that you've read or trainings or certain you know th- things of that things of that nature. Mm-hmm. Uh, if the financial receipt, right, which is a receipt that shows that what you are, who you are, uh, and what you can do created value, right, that, you know, that right there does, it never goes away unless you, you know, get hit in the head and, you know, have amnesia right. or whatever, yeah. right? But if you retain that, even though the money or the resources go away, you still have, you know, essentially what created it in the first place. So let's maybe go through this this idea of, uh, the anxieties that people do have in regards mm-hmm. to money, which I think all comes down to fear. So, how would you like? How would you go about uh, go about a conversation of teaching somebody, or you know, having a dialogue of what their specific financial anxieties are? Well, that's a great question. I mean, I, I actually might start right with what you were saying, and that is asking the person uh, how much they believe in. Do they understand what? those personal qualities are and do they believe in them Mm -hmm. because a lot of people who we would see on the outside as having these talents that have created their wealth or Mm -hmm. created their success there can be a sense of um, low self-confidence there and sometimes people don't even recognize I'm thinking of somebody who uh, was kind of a whiz kid made a lot of money in sales Mm -hmm. so really good at business really good at sales dropped out of college to do it Mm -hmm. made a lot of money really fast Mm -hmm. Um, some you know got in you know first time uh, success got in with some of the wrong folks. It all crumb, crumbled, fell apart. And when he and I were talking, he didn't he didn't recognize what you're talking about. Mm. He didn't understand what he, he thought he got lucky. Mm. So it's internalizing versus mm. externalizing, right? If I internalize uh, my qualities, if I understand how I got to where I am, so what sometimes psychologists call a mastery experience. Mm-hmm. Do you understand your role in your success? What mm-hmm. you contributed? If you if you have that 
then then you can bounce back faster. You, you I mean, it's it's stressful and traumatic, obviously, but the recovery time's shorter, and, and usually people come out of that ahead. They've learned from it. Yep. But if you externalize the responsibility, if you give it away, if you feel like the biggest one is luck, people who people are like, oh, I got lucky, yep. right, t- right place, right time. I don't really have any qualities. It was just the time. Yep. It was the luck. That's terrible. If they give it to other people, oh, my business partners. And that's what this guy was doing. Even though these business partners are the ones that were really, from my opinion, the root of the problem. Yeah. and why the money in the company went away, he, he saw them as more competent. They were older, more successful in a lot of other ways. He trusted them. We had to break it down to helping him see where he had mastered things. Huh. And for him, it had a lot to do with getting back to his ability to work with other people. So sales. But he really likes people. He likes them. Yep. And he wants them to have a good product in this case. Mm-hmm. And so he likes people. So that was actually a quality that these other guys didn't have. Yeah. The other one was just a good sense of who to trust. Yeah. You know, He had a really good sense of who to trust and who not to trust. Ironically, he trusted somebody when he knew he shouldn't have. And that's how he ended up with one of these partners that kind of brought it all down. But getting back to trusting himself, yep. he won't make that make mistake again. And that was the true lesson. I mean, imagine yeah. if he didn't have that dialogue, he would have now had this stigma mm-hmm. attached to the experience, which was, you know, th- it was it was luck. And I, mm-hmm. you know, I'll have to be lucky in order to right. be successful again. And then he may get in with another set of bad business partners mm-hmm. and just kind of repeat that over and over and over until he gets it. Until and that's what, I, that's what I was going to say before. It's unfortunately, kind of, some people don't. Yeah, they don't. And, yeah. and that's what I would say. It's like where, where you're at right now, I mean, you, we, have to make, we have to make progress as human beings, I, I think. I, maybe I'm totally wrong, but I would say that we're wired to continually do more and more and more, improve mm-hmm. ourselves, learn more, be more, uh, and try to find more fulfillment, more achievement. And looking at individuals and how, what they associate with the variables that create that, I think oftentimes they disc, like you were saying, they discount themselves, mm-hmm. right? Absolutely. And they say, well, all, the stars aligned, right? Or yeah. this happened and this happened, or it was that because of that. And I think also people look at success mm-hmm. and they say, well, he was lucky, or they were lucky, or right. they, you know, they, they just knew that person and knew that person and knew that person, which I would say in some cases it's, you know, there's an element yeah. of that, but yeah. it doesn't, it shouldn't discount the person's, you know, their involvement in what they created. Oh, absolutely. Um, and in fact, you know, uh, it's not that I don't believe in a little bit of luck mm-hmm. because occasionally you, you meet the right person at the right time or something does fall into place. And we, we know that's true. Uh, some of us have the genetics, uh, the lucky genetics. You know, I'm, I'm five nine, so the chances of me being a center in the NBA were you know, it's never going to happen, right? Yeah. Um, so sometimes we get a little lucky. But I think it's more back to this idea of internalizing a sense of who you are and, and, and giving yourself credit and knowing what your strengths are then when the luck comes along, you know what to do with it. Exactly. You know what? Yep. And that's, that's what's, oh, that's a whole other conversation too, which is, you know, who, who you are, what you understand, uh, and your level of education, you, you analyze or you're able to capitalize on circumstance and situations yeah. more readily, right? Because it's not, the, not to say that, you know, the, the, you know the, the clapper, like somebody didn't have that idea before, but who had the resources? Right. I don't know why that, that because we all love came the clapper. Mind, yeah, Come on, Pat. We, we all love the clapper. <laughs> but the, you know, but uh, the person that understood the resources to take it from idea to marketplace, sure, right? That's a person who's able to capitalize it, which mm-hmm. comes from experience, which comes from training, which comes yeah. from network, right? But in the end, I would say that you know, an individual they have to look. I mean, this is how I look at myself: mm-hmm. is I'm the I'm the true asset. Right. And I may lose in certain areas, but I know that I've created value in the past. Mm -hmm. And if things do fall apart, I still have that intellectual asset to recreate or do something else. And I would say to the salesperson, that's one of the the most amazing talents to have because Mm -hmm. all commerce is communication. Sure. Right. And the communication is between people. Yeah. And so if you have that, that's one of the, uh, out of that entire loss that he had, mm-hmm. right, he was probably one of the more valuable pieces, even though he didn't think he, he was. You no, know, exactly. No, you're exactly right. And I would say that um, one of the, like, if we want to be practical for our listeners today, so so that they can say what you just said about themselves someday, or what this, this uh, friend, I'd call him a friend now, uh, can say about himself uh, who lost the business but was good at people and sales and things, is uh, right now I would actually, uh, this is an exercise I have people do all the time. Take a week, and at the end of each day, take 
two minutes. I, I, I can't stand to do things that take very long, so most of my exercises are short, sweet, to the point. Take two minutes at the end of your day, shut everything off, you know, turn off your phone, do everything, just two minutes, sit down and say, okay, can I think of at least one, you can do more if you can think of them, at least one positive result that happened in my life today, and you write it down. Just, just briefly, you know, something it could be relatively routine, but it's a positive result. And then the second part, and this is the mastery part, is identify what was my role in creating that outcome. Now, a narcissist would say, it's all me, <laughs> okay? And those are people that get into trouble because they can't work with others. Mm -hmm. The person who struggles with self-confidence would say, it's the luck, it's the externalizing factors. Mm -hmm. But uh, what we're after is a balance because mm -hmm. in any of our success, there are other people that always play a role. So mm -hmm. at the end of the day, when you do this exercise, you're gonna easily think, oh, well, there, th this was a positive outcome in my day, a positive result but you know, all these other people help me with it. And it, that's mm -hmm. true. Mm -hmm. throw, you throw them in there, identify them. But what you write down is, what was my role? What was my skill? Yeah. What was my ability? And as a psychologist, what was my behavior mm -hmm. that helped contribute to that? And then at the end of the week, just sit back and read them all yeah. and look at where are the connections? What are the traits that go from day to day to day? Those are those skills that you have. And this, my example for this person, it would have been people. Me talking to other people is would have been the thread that connected all of those for him. Mm -hmm. And that's where, I mean, we, we were having a discussion before we actually started recording, but that's where, you know, you look at you as being the asset and there's other parts and you're abso absolutely right. There are, uh, you know, whether it's partners or the economy or legislation or, or, or whatever there, you know, there could be a a product that becomes obsolete that you don't necessarily have control over. But Your knucklehead brother-in-law wants to invest fifty grand. Exactly. Yeah, or it, it could be a variety. <laughs> it could be a variety of things. But when you understand that you are the the you know essentially the piece that you can control, everything else has to fall under this. Well, if it goes awry, okay, you you have to understand why. It wasn't necessarily you. There are just some things that don't work out. So you right. had, you know, we were talking about the idea of of acceptance, which mm -hmm. is when you really start to bring the the fears of something not going according to expectation. Mm -hmm. Okay, you have anxiety, you have a fear, which is it's not going to work out. But then when you bring that to present, really start asking good questions about, well, why am I afraid? Or well, what if it doesn't happen? Or what if this occurs? Or what if this doesn't occur? You start to understand, okay, what you know, maybe what to do when a situation like that becomes, mm -hmm. you know, becomes reality. Oh yeah, definitely. I mean, acceptance is. It's funny, when you're in a fearful place, if you're feeling fear about something, you usually don't want to accept it. We're in resistance at that point. Mm -hmm. We're trying to resist whatever the issue is. Mm -hmm. um, and so when you bring up acceptance to people, if it, maybe some of our listeners right now are in a difficult financial place. They're mm -hmm. wondering, how can I get ahead? And they're afraid of the security they may lose, et cetera. Mm -hmm. But acceptance in the context we were talking about it, it means it, it doesn't mean giving up or giving in to something. It means understanding the true actual nature of something or your situation so that you can have control over it. Mm -hmm. And that's where you start dividing things up. You start to be able to say, well, I accept the fact that um, uh, I've lost my job. I've lost my source of income this month. And so there are certain things about that that I can't change, those external factors. Mm -hmm. But because of that, now I can get out of that emotional mind and get into my logical mind mm -hmm. and say, but what parts can I control? And if, you know, uh, maybe I, I know what some of my strengths and qualities are because I listened to Patrick's podcast and I wrote those things down every week mm -hmm. that I was supposed to write down. Now I know. And so that's something I can control. So mm -hmm. acceptance. And then you make a commitment to action. So now what we've done is we've taken a fearful thing, which is some future event. It could be in a minute. It could be in 10 years. We're, we're focusing on this future event. It's causing us stress, fear, mm -hmm. anxiety. And we've taken it into the present by accepting it. Mm -hmm. And then we make a commitment to action, which is uh, utilizing or uh, starting a plan in the present. So it could be that that person... Uh, isn't going to be able to go into work anymore. So tomorrow, the next day, that's not, that's not what they can do. But if they have been able to do this process of accepting that's their situation, mm -hmm. making, uh, recognizing what they can control and making a commitment to action, tomorrow they'll be up and out of bed doing things that reverse the situation for mm -hmm. them because they're only focused on the things that they can control yeah. in their environment. And that changes everything. Absolutely. Yeah. And that's where we get a lot of great stories that most of us love to read about yeah. people who have been down 
and then bounced way back up mm-hmm. above where they were in the beginning because yep. there's a learning process, but it's really that it's commitment to action. And I think accepting what you can't control helps get some of those barriers out of your way. Yeah. And I think the, I mean, and you can tell me that I'm totally crazy, but I, I think that, you know, kind of the world, the world operates in wanting to teach us lessons, right? And because again, it's that, that, that innate desire we have to, to progress and to do more and to be yeah. more. So you look at really the environments that are going to cause anxiety, they're going to happen. I mean, it's, right. it's going to be everywhere. Mm-hmm. It's, I think it's, a, it's a, just a part, of, a part of life. But I think those that have the mindset of being able to accept that that's going to be the case mm-hmm. and accept that it's a good, it's a good thing and it's going to help right. empower them, it's going to make them more valuable. Yeah. And it's going to help them maximize that, that asset. And I think if people started to associate those type of benefits right to that environment and again you can go through so many different you know so many different examples on that but when they are able to associate that then it's like okay well that is, yeah that could be a good thing so i'm not as afraid as i i used to be about it oh absolutely man i'm glad i agree with you because i thought if i had to tell you you were crazy you wouldn't invite me back again so. <laughs> i would totally invite you back <laughs> i don't care <laughs> no I, would, I yeah <laughs> i'm kidding no you you're you're spot on um absolutely i think that uh it's really, really important. So it, there's this funny phenomenon, okay? So sometimes people, I'll, I'll challenge them on this, and they'll say, no, I don't do that. But then they realize they do, because mm-hmm. most of us do. And as we hope that the struggles that we had today won't be there tomorrow. You kind of hope they're not going to be there. Mm-hmm. You haven't really done anything to fix them. You're just kind of, tomorrow's, you know, tomorrow that grumpy secretary is going to be friendly to me. Or like in the back recesses <laughs> yeah. of our mind, we hope it, things will be easier by magic almost. Mm-hmm. And that's not a healthy place to be because what you're doing is you're setting yourself up for chronic disappointment. Yeah. Whatever the stress, I hope the traffic won't be bad tomorrow. Now, nobody's consciously saying that if you have bad traffic every day. Yeah. But unless you've dealt with this, kind of in the back of your mind, you're kind of hoping, oh, maybe it'll be an easy traffic. Is it easy traffic day, hard traffic day? You know? And you're stressing yourself out before you even get to where you need to go. Mm-hmm. So by kind of honestly looking and evaluating, accepting some of the stressors, uh, if we want to be more specific just about a person's financial life, not Mm. only how they're bringing money in, but Mm. what they're doing with it. Mm. If they can start by using some acceptance about what the roadblocks, limitations, uh, abilities even are, then they kind of set that stressor to the side. They marginalize at least some of those roadblocks Mm. and they're able to then get into this commitment part. They're waking up in the, in the morning saying, yep, I knew that would be tough, but I have an answer for it. Well, there are, it it also allows a focus on what the most important issues are that are impeding whatever that next step is. Oh yeah. Right. Because I, I think that, you know, there's only so much energy you have during the day and if you're always focused on, you know, what, what, you know, the anxieties and the fears, then you have very little energy to focus in other places that's going to capitalize on certain situations. Oh, yeah. Right. So I would say that, you know, and one of the things I wanted to talk about was, you know, the environment that you choose to, to be around. Because I think that has a lot to do mm-hmm. with how you develop personally. And that environment could be, you know, the this, this secretary. Because if it was a secretary that, you know, maybe you were the boss and you just kept the person around and right. they just kept doing the same thing. Yeah. I mean, that's one of those things where, wow, I have control where I can get a person in there. That- I laugh a little because I, I know <laughs> bosses that they it dawns on them five years later. They're like, that this hasn't been working for five years. Oh, gosh, I can give you yeah. many stories on my, some of my you know experiences. Yeah. But that's that's the thing is, you know, you, you look at the environment and how much that impacts you. And I would say, you know, if you're not a, a, a business owner, okay, it could be the friends that you are oh, around, yeah. or it could be Personal the television shows that you watch mm-hmm. or the radio programs that you, that you watch or not watch, listen to, yeah. right? Well, in this case, you kind of watch it and listen to it. That's yeah, the modern era, Patrick. <laughs> but that's, but that's the point. It's like, you, there's so many things there that yeah. could, you know, change the way in which your uh, Even standard something is. as simple as w- watching the news. So we're coming out of the presidential election and in the interesting show that was yeah. and um that's a depressing thing when a person feels out of control and they have to watch that news over and over and over and over again it's rarely you're getting like happy news from huffington post it's mm-hmm. it's this it's just non-stop stressful important but stressful news mm-hmm. so that's an environment a person can change i i often ask people to limit how much just general news they watch yeah and it's i i also say you have to look if you're going to you know watch tv or watch television so they actually challenged one of one of the guys here on something which i'll explain in a second but it's you you turn that you know what maybe was meaningless into a lesson because with trump 
like I didn't really I didn't vote for him. I didn't really participate in the back and forth, but I found it incredibly fascinating just how irrational people became. Oh, right. And yeah. the things they said and what they did, it's like but it, it also showed like and we had a whole podcast on this is how, you know, Trump really manipulated that psychology. And I, I, I at least think he, I think he did it intentionally. Right. Seems because because be, you know. he he understands psychology. Right. And I think that, you know, the, that lesson is profound. So what I told my other, you know, one of my guys. You know, because everybody has everybody has so much time during the day. We've talked about that. Where do you dedicate that time, and what are you doing in that time? Mm-hmm. So he said, "Well, my you know my wife she likes to to listen to this you know this TV program, so we watch that together, and that's kind of like my zone out time." I'm like, "Well, turn it into a zone in time. Yeah. Right? What could you what could you do to find a lesson? And it happened to be The Office, like the the TV the show, TV The show, Office. The office yeah, yeah. There's a million lessons in there. Oh yeah, right yeah. about business and mm-hmm. about culture and about humor, right? Yeah. But it depends." on the lens that you have and how you how you look at it. Mm-hmm. So I think it's the other thing too is like how people view the world, right? It all has to do with, you know, what they know, who they are, uh, and essentially their their psychology, which can always be cleared up and and improved, right? And sure. that's where I think we're talking about here is I think the, the the money that people have, I think the first component that's important is to realize that they're the ones that did something to get it okay that ability to do something mm-hmm. is not going to just like disappear okay that's the first thing right the second thing is if you don't have what you consider what's going to give you you know enough to fill that first rung of the maslow's hierarchy of needs which is physiological then the uh, i think it's the security then relationships right. and then uh self-esteem right and can't i can't remember exactly how it goes but if you're if you're filling that up okay look at like what it takes to to do that and if you don't have enough mm-hmm. okay we're we live in a society that is ripe with opportunity i mean you have kids that are making bajillions of dollars uh collectively not you know one person but building apps and technology I oh mean, yeah it's just amazing that the the new types of businesses and commerce that exist the opportunities are all over the place to do really well creativity yeah is but, a but the commodity. ability to capitalize on that you, you're the one that has to change and mm-hmm. i think as you you know really look at how your environment and your standards okay are affected by that environment okay change your environment change what you're doing when you're waking up what you're eating what there's all sorts of ways in which you would do that so maybe uh, as we're kind of not really focused and going all over the place here what are you know as as somebody is having issues psychologically and they're trying to improve on certain aspects of their life and let's say they have a loss let's say that there's this painful fear that they have where it's what like what do you what do you typically do to walk them through uh, you know, going from where they're at to where you think they should be or where they think they should okay. be. Yeah. Um, and, so, we can, and we can associate that with money pretty easily, I'm sure. Yeah, no, uh, for sure. So, I mean, let's, we'll just back off a little and we'll just talk about kind of fears. So you, you mentioned, you know, if a person has a fear, um, a worry that's holding them back. So one of the things to do is kind of break that down. What is, and we can use, we use different words, right? Sometimes we use anxiety, fear, worry, stress. That's usually from a thinking point of view, it's a focus on a future event mm-hmm. that you perceive little or perhaps no control over. So here's this thing coming up in the future. It could be a few moments from now. It could be years from now. But I perceive little or no control over that. And so what effect does that have on me in the present? Mm -hmm. And that's a sense of being out of control. And so a person will often kind of spin their wheels, feel desperate, maybe make reactive decisions, maybe make no decision, just wait for things to happen Mm -hmm. because they're in this panicky sort of out of control state in the present, even though that event hasn't come yet. Mm -hmm. That doesn't mean the event's not scary or stressful. um, You know, uh, that's for sure. But the question is, like, what do I do with that? Right. If I see this coming, what can I do in the present? Mm -hmm. And so that's the big question is how can I take something from that future? I sometimes call this time travel. Mm -hmm. You know, if if you if you don't have a DeLorean with a flux capacitor, Mm -hmm. if you do have a DeLorean, you're pretty freaking cool. (laughs) But if you have if if it's sans uh, flux capacitor, we can't time travel and fix things before we get there. Right. So what we have to do is ask ourselves, what elements of that future event can I bring into the present literally right now? to do something about. At the very basic answer to that would be planning. So at at the very least, we can do planning. Mm -hmm. Um, But I mean, for example, let's say, uh, I love the office example that you were given. Let's say, let's say somebody is, they're trying to get some, you know, it's high quality time watching sitcoms with your wife, but let's say, let's say they, they need to unwind or that is a routine that they have. Maybe they watch, you know, one of these endless uh, Netflix series or something with their spouse or kids or whatever. 
but they have this future event. So if you can identify that that's their, it's kind of their Achilles heel, it's their worry, it's their mm-hmm. stress. So first they need to identify, well, well, what are the elements of that? What am I really worried about? And I, even though I hate writing things down myself, writing things down makes things real. Mm-hmm. So I'm a bullet point guy. So you might sit and say, well, what are, the, what are the top two or three things about that future event that are really stressing me? What do I feel less control over than others? Mm-hmm. They might write those down. And they may say, okay, now I'm going to go watch The Office with my wife. And I'm going to have those things on my mind mm-hmm. in the present moment. I mean, I'm enjoying time. You know, we're cuddling on the couch, holding hands, watching The Office. So romantic. And, uh, but I'm going to be thinking about these two or three things. Yeah. And I'm actually going to look for situations in, in my current environment, which is the TV show, mm-hmm. to see if it sheds any light on it. You know, it may not. But the truth is, by letting those things percolate, you're actually doing something in, a, in the present that can give you inspiration. So yep. sometimes it, it's, a, it's a song you hear, it's a conversation you have, it's a TV show or a movie you watch, and it doesn't necessarily answer it for you, but because you are purposefully letting that simmer, yep. you will be inspired on things you can then go do right now that might positively affect that future event. Yeah, and the, yeah, the con- when the context change, the results change. Oh, yeah. So, so let's maybe look at, okay, so looking into the future, bringing it present, uh, that's, that's a way to, I mean, reduce anxiety, reduce stress. Yeah. But let's say that it, like, happens today. And it's like boom. Mm-hmm. What to add in that environment? So where you does blindsided? You're, you're saying bl- you're blindsided. It's something yeah. that you didn't prepare for, and it's like yeah. boom, you're out of a job, or you know, you're the the last A track manufacturer on the planet that you were working for <laughs> is gone. <laughs> you didn't see replaced. that coming, huh? Oh, so, dang it! But it's one it's one of those things where it's like back. Ben. It, it, <laughs> You could probably sell them on eBay for, for a lot. Yeah, I, don't know. Oh, I bet you could. There's yeah. somebody, there's there's somebody, somebody playing the A-Track, track, yeah. maybe. Someone that has too much money <laughs> that they don't know what to do with it yeah. other than buy A-Track players. Uh, but I would say, yeah, okay, that, that happens. And what do you – like how does some – what's the best way for somebody to, to process that? Or, or they're going through just tremendous amount right now in the present. Like what's a, what's, what are some things that they could do yeah. to – understand the situation, remove as much of the emotion as possible, mm-hmm. and really turn, like shift that context. Go from, wow, this is a crappy time to, wow, this is a, a, a very valuable lesson for me to right. you know, build on and improve from. Yeah, no, that's a great question. So so l- let's, let's think of it this way. So for example, let's say you're going along your day, if I get your, your example, and things are going fine, all of a sudden, boom, you get hit with some really bad news. Uh, it can be anything, I suppose, but you know, financial news, uh, you lost your job, anything, you didn't expect it. Um, that creates this kind of fight or flight response. It's very, very uh, inborn in us. It's a survival technique. Mm-hmm. But the problem with that is, is it rarely really applies anymore to our situation. We're not really needing to fight or run away. I mean, I suppose, you know, if it's a mugger, you're good to go. But in, in, in these social problems, uh, relationship problems, uh, financial problems, these sorts of things, r- running away or fighting don't help. The problem is it has a specific neurological effect. Mm-hmm. And what that is, is it lights up the centers of our brain that have to do with physical activity. Mm-hmm. And it turns down the centers of our brain, our frontal lobe specifically, that have to do with logical problem solving. Mm-hmm. And so what you need to do to answer your question, I'll tell you how to do it in just a second, but to answer your question is you have to turn off those those reactive, adrenaline-driven action centers of your brain and turn on, back on, the logical problem-solving parts. We have to mm-hmm. get out of that emotional brain back into the logical brain. Because otherwise what happens is if you stay in that fight or flight, you probably aren't going to just go screaming out of your business building, mm-hmm. but your brain will. Your brain is going to run away, and the way it does it is catastrophizing. Mm. If this, then that, then that, then that, and pretty soon you're living in a van down by the river, (laughs) right? (laughs) And it could be a big problem that could send you into that sort of stress for sure, but if you if your brain runs away in fight or flight then it'll catastrophize it'll turn the problem whatever it is no matter how big it is it'll put a magnifying glass on it and make it worse yep. and then you're spinning more and more and more out of control and you're not getting those logical centers turned back on so mm-hmm. what do you do first thing you need to do is call yourself on it the, the, we call this metacognition thinking about our thinking is one of the most powerful things we can do to stay logical and focused and do some good problem solving mm-hmm. so when you are having a panic attack believe it or not the shrink is right now telling you to talk to yourself what you want to do is say I'm having a panic attack this is the worst thing that has ever happened to me or this is this is unbelievable I can't believe I'm hearing this mm-hmm. I am panicking right now now right there you're, you recognize what's happening you call yourself on it so you start this 
this process of gaining back control of yourself. Instead of being reactive, that little step makes you proactive, mm -hmm. okay? The second thing you need to do is calm it down. So before we get in, the, the, a lot of people are like, well, I got to fix this. But you, you're, you're trying to fix a logical problem, most likely, with, with emotions. irrational yep. emotional behavior. So what you want to do, in my opinion, is take a break. No, if, if, if some catastrophe has actually happened, some big problem has happened, you have time for a break, believe it or not. Okay? So what you do is you say, excuse me. If you are in a meeting, guess what? If you're an adult, no one can tell you you can't go to the bathroom. So <laughs> believe it or not, little shrink trick, if you really need to leave someplace, you say, excuse me, I need a rest where's your restroom? And you take a break. Okay, that was just a little, put that in your back pocket. Yeah. But you take a break, you go and you sit down, you get grounded. So you have to resist the urge to problem solve and say, I need to, and the reason I say the, the, the centers of your brain is I like people to visualize it. So that frontal lobe of your brain where you really focus and think, if you look on a functional MRI and you watch a person problem solving, you see a lot of that part of the brain is, is lit up. But right now, that's gone kind of dark. And the middle of your brain, where you have emotion processing and, and your motor cortex, where you need to move and run, that's all going haywire. What we need to do is calm that down and visualize that kind of calming down to a softer color. We need to light up the frontal part again. Mm -hmm. So you sit down in a chair, you press your feet into the ground, and you breathe. In through your nose, out through your mouth, calm, calm your heart rate down. Mm -hmm. A lot of this is physiological. You can't just tell your adrenal glands to shut down, but you can calm them down in a secondary manner. Hmm. Breathing slows your heart rate down. Heart rate tells the adrenal glands we're okay, we can calm down. And so I actually have a person as what they'll do is they'll breathe in through their nose as they scrunch up their toes, breathe out through their mouth and relax. That rhymed, I didn't mean it to. But it sounded good. I thought it was perfect. Yeah, yeah thank you. <laughs> um, and after they do about three to five breaths, that's all it takes. And this is the silly part, but it's important. You say to yourself who you are, where you are, and what you're doing. You literally get grounded in the moment. Why would you say your name? That's a little lame, but that rhymed too. I'm on a roll. Uh, Dr. Matt <laughs> Seuss. Yes. <will> uh, <laughs> yes, trademark. Um, so what? But your name is your most personal thing. That's you, right? Like I said, when we panic, when we stress about things, our brain runs away into the future, mm -hmm. to, the, to the bad event. It catastrophizes. It makes it worse than it is. We really need to bring ourselves back. So you say who you are. That's your name, personal. Where you are, you're grounded right here, mm -hmm. and what you're doing or what you're about. And it might be, you know, I am, I am calming myself down so I can problem solve. I'm turning back on my logical brain. Whatever you need to say that you're about to do. Who you are, where you are, what you're doing. Now, this is kind of damage control, but believe it or not, you're making a neurological, physiological change in your body. People who practice this, so sometimes it's worth practicing every day for a few minutes in your office, just this grounding technique. Mm -hmm. Three to five breaths, you, you, you scrunch up those toes as you breathe in, you relax them as you exhale. Huh slow and deep as you can you'll do it once and you'll be like oh that was really slow you can do it slower do it slower more deeply and then after you're at whatever you're at three or five breaths you say who you are where you are what you're doing hmm. this gets you very focused and grounded very mindful in the moment that's empowering so then you leave you leave your office or the bathroom stall wherever you had to go off to and you you're now back in the same situation but you're a grounded more logic uh, driven person and whatever the problem is you're much more likely to tap into what you were talking about Patrick and that is you know those personal resources a person has mm -hmm. their qualities of who they are that got them there mm -hmm. you can tap right back into those to help you deal with this this surprise problem that just popped up yeah and I think that looking at those techniques whether it's meditative techniques uh, or different patterns you can put yourself put yourself in doing that you know when it's in a non rash or non emotional state yeah. uh, that helps to kind of create maybe I mean you still have your fight or flight but when that yeah. happens it's kind of like you know what to do next right yeah. it isn't this like black hole of well do I you know jump off a bridge or do I do this or do I do that mm -hmm. it's like you you have something that you could go to to calm calm yourself down yeah it's actually brain training so the coolest thing is anytime we learn something new 
our brain makes neural connections. Mm -hmm. And if we practice something, if we have the same experience over and over and over again, if uh, you were to go memorize a poem, you're actually making a neural connection in your brain so that you can retrieve it more easily and more easily. That happens for logical things. It also happens for emotional things. And some people have inadvertently allowed life to train them to be emotionally reactive. Mm -hmm. So they have all these emotional pathways that when a little problem happens, it feels like a catastrophe. That's, that's not a pathway, it's a super highway. Mm. But by doing mindfulness and meditation techniques, by practicing is something, literally what I just described, if, if your listeners would, would take a month and do that every day, that's a two minute exercise. Mm. In their office, two minutes a day, I can guarantee you're gonna start to feel less reactive, more proactive, calm, focused, on all the little stressors that they have during the day because what they're doing is when they're not in crisis they're training those pathways now they're these pathways are starting to take over from those emotionally reactive ones just like a pathway can be trained it can fade away hmm. you know uh, I don't know if you've ever had this experience but you crammed for a test in school you got the answer right and then you know later that afternoon you can't remember it anymore no, it because because <laughs> that little teeny pathway you started it faded away you didn't turn it into a super highway yet yeah. and so um, these sorts of things should be done in my opinion and one of my favorite things to do is working with businesses individuals but also groups and teaching them how to do simple mindfulness training techniques that actually make neurological changes but they feel it emotionally and behaviorally hmm. focus is better they're not as reactive um, if you want to get a, a, if you want to move up in your company you can't be an emotionally reactive person you mm. have to be solid and how do we get solid? Yeah. So what? So help me, because those are those are amazing things. And I think I learned because during like the 2008, 2009, I had you know a year after the the business was created, I had some some very difficult times, and I came to you know certain exercises, certain routines that that improved everything. Mm -hmm. uh, and one of the things where you can maybe help uh, dissect it for me to understand the psychology of it was um, w what I started to focus on with my, my family and those that I cared about. And I think that has a lot to do with, with business and finance, and, and, and which I'll kind of tie into it. And that's the, when you start thinking about others and start doing things for others, that immediately gets you out of your head. Sure. And it gets you to focus on other people that you care about. So I, so there's a, a newsletter that I religiously would do everything that it said for probably a, a year. So it was the All Pro dad and it was done by um uh, tony it's done still by tony dungy so who's the oh yeah he's the like a football, football commentator was with you know the colts yeah, he's, a, he's an amazing coach amazing yeah. guy so i so so i listened to that and it was like the 10 things you should do today or the three things for your daughter or the t five things here that and i would do every and it was also like marital advice mm. and even though i didn't want to do it i mm -hmm. did it like every single cool. time right i did exactly what he told me you know what it said in that newsletter yeah. and even though it was it was difficult and i was you know focusing here and there, the, the ability really to just use that as a guide and do something, it totally removed that. And it was almost instantaneous, mm -hmm. uh, but still I resisted it, which is probably another issue. But here's, <laughs> but here's what I would associate you gotta with. You got to do what Coach Dungey says. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. But, I was, but looking at really, you know, the business and the finance side of things. Wait, wait, wait. How did it turn out? Amazing. Yeah. I mean, that's whenever, so I, you know, whenever I do have those things, I start to, my, my go-to is to focus on other people is to, you know, either write some in you know, a gratitude journal or to yeah. send a, a text to my wife or to do mm -hmm. something for, for my kids, leave a note or do something like that. Cause mm -hmm. I think once you do something and serve, uh, provide value to those that you love, mm -hmm. right? It's, it's amazing. It's like, it totally evaporates the, 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 the present anxiety. Now there may be some, mm -hmm. you know, lingering effects of it, but it makes it a lot easier to deal with. Oh, for sure. I think what you're doing in those instances from the psychological or cognitive thinking point of view is you're, you're changing your perspective, mm -hmm. right? And so we get very myopic on our, our problems, or maybe it's not even a problem, it's just a task, something that's very important in our work that we do. And that can become, because we're myopic, it looks like the entire world to us. Yeah. And by by stepping out of that and doing um, you know thoughtful, service, gratitude-oriented sorts of exercises, 
you know, just in a notebook or, or directly with other people that are important in our lives, it creates this contrast between the, the, the focus that we need to have, so mm-hmm. the problem solving or the, the project, and then also those other high quality of life items. Yeah. And so by creating that contrast, it puts it back in perspective. And instead of saying, you know, a lot of people say, well, if I do that, Dr. William, I'm worried that I'm not going to work on my project as much. I'm just going to want to go play baseball with my kid. But and there should be some of that, <laughs> believe believe me. But but actually, I think the effect that it typically has is you work harder, better, and more efficiently. So instead of wasting your whole evening on this project, because you have this new perspective, this contrast between your other high-quality areas of life, your brain can do a lot more, your body can do a lot more than, than you think it can when you're in that stress and anxiety state. And so instead of wasting time, you're more efficient, you're more effective, you get, more, you get higher quality of work done, and... You're sending the text to your wife or you're going to your kid's game yeah. or you're doing those sorts of things that are really, really important. You're taking – I have people that, that – when the gratitude journal, which is a really great exercise, yeah. uh, people have resisted me on that. They're like, I, I can't take two minutes a day yeah. and write in my gratitude journal. But once they start to do it, they realize just that simple exercise changes their whole perspective yep. and their emotional state. They, they get way more done mm-hmm. and they feel better. They're happier. I mean, they're enjoying life. It's such an interesting – dichotomy almost it is because it's like totally against what you're naturally inclined to to do and there's right. two as you were talking there's two stories that i that i remember the first one uh was with 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 einstein and it was a short short story i'm gonna totally paraphrase it but he you know the theory of relativity he worked on for for a long time and it actually actually took him quitting to keep working on it where he really discovered mm-hmm. right he mm-hmm. it, it came to his came to his mind he mm-hmm. let go of that he let go of the influence that he had there and he just he had that that yeah. that spark or that thought that filled in the gap. Yeah. The other one was uh, Buckminster Fuller, who created the di- the geodesic dome, uh, kind of a philosopher type of guy. Right. And uh, he so he was at the point where uh, he was down on the I think it was the uh, Lake Michigan, and he was going to commit suicide. And he oh. goes down there and he started to think about his family, his wife, his kids, and. And and that right there refocused him. And then he realized just how how stupid he was. And and from there he realized all of these amazing ideas. And he accredited it, you know, really to his change in focus. Oh yeah. So I would I would say you know looking at how it helped maybe uh, me in business to an extent is when you start to focus on other people in business, okay, or other people. Uh, you know, with with whom you associate, and it's to create value and to do something for them. It's amazing what type of results are, but that's the nature of commerce, right? Nobody's going to sure. buy. Nobody's going to give money to somebody and get something of less value in return. It's not going to last very long. Unless they, it's me they, investing. <laughs> I'm just kidding. But that's the, but think about it. Like no, yeah. that's the nature of a transaction is you exchange money for something you value more you than value money, more. Yeah. right? So it always comes down to there's always another party to the money that you have, and it's the person that gives you it. Mm-hmm. So looking at ways in which you create value, and it, it, could, it probably should be a tremendous am- amount of that value mm-hmm. uh, to really have a lot of money to change your financial situation. So that's you know really when it comes down to it. I mean that's that psychology is what. Uh, help help me, or at least that shift in psychology. But it took a very uh, very painful yeah. event for me to to realize that. So, how I guess we can kind of conclude with the the podcast with, okay, when how do we avoid? Is there a way to avoid that, or is it just unavoidable? Like those painful situations of life, is there a way that we can take that to the present and uh, figure out a way to completely avoid it, or is it inevitable? And and if it is inevitable, which I, I'm convinced that it is, okay, how do we shift the context? How do we shift that focus so it's something that changes you and makes you improve and is better for you and, or, uh, other than destroying you, which it does to a lot of people? Yeah, I mean, those are great questions, um, but important. I mean, you're, you're asking the questions that will help us deal with the inevitable stressors, we could just say that, Mm -hmm. but also avoid a lot of either the frequency or severity of those stressors. So I would say just to recap a few things, one is knowing who you are. What do I bring to my life? What are my skills, those mastery experiences? Do I know what my core value is in general and specifically in my career? Have I taken the time out to really think about those? You mentioned college degrees, and you know, the truth is um, a college degree is no guarantee of that. Of, of having the skill and the quality 
that you bring to whatever it is you do. You have to go above and beyond any training you've gotten in order to understand what that is. So mm-hmm. I'd say that that would definitely be be a place to start. We're talking about self-development here, and so that would be one. Mm-hmm. Another one is understanding wh- how do you, how do I handle stress? Some people, I mean, it is kind of a bell-shaped curve, and you'll get some people that just kind of from the get-go, they're, they're less reactive, they're more thoughtful, they, they stay in that logical place, their fight-or-flight mm-hmm. response is lower. Um, there's some real positives to that. There's definitely some drawbacks. Mm-hmm. Uh, you have some people on the other end of the spectrum. There are these high, high performance, high achieving, but high stressing people, mm-hmm. and they're very reactive. They tend to worry and catastrophize, like we've talked about. So I'd say another another tool to put in your toolbox would be self awareness mm-hmm. on on your own stress management, and am I taking the time I need to do to improve that? So we talked a little bit about mindfulness techniques and self development. Um, for some people, it's a very active thing, getting out, moving, doing things. For other people, it it might be sitting down and learning to meditate or use mindfulness throughout the day. Mm -hmm. And then the third one is a plan for the inevitable stressors that come your way. And and maybe even reframing that in your head. So I, I love the term reframing. Reframing, just as a side note, is this idea of taking a picture. So if you have a you know, if we're in my office, I have, I have, I like abstracts. I have this abstract painting of colors, and it has a very, uh, you know, hopefully manly sort of, you know, rectangular hopefully. steel frame. Yeah, hopefully I didn't want to sound <laughs> overly manly. <clears throat> manly frame uh, there. And, you it's know, not like, like Putin on like a, a shirtless on a bear, right? Yeah, exactly. And, uh, and so if you took that, if you popped that frame off, and, and you have this abstract painting, and then you put, like, uh, I think of my grandma's house, and she loved French Rococo. So maybe it's a big oval, gold, gaudy, with cherubs and, and, and flowers and, and birds on it. And now, it's the same picture, but it looks really different. It would look really out of place. It wouldn't fit. I'm not sure where that fits anymore, but it wouldn't fit in my office or, or most people's office. So reframing we reframe to the negative. We need to reframe to the positive on purpose. So if you say... So Long way for me to say, an inevitable stressor sounds awful, but what if you reframe that to, inevitably I'm going to have stressors come along and I'm going to see them as opportunities. And now we've reframed, that's the same event. Maybe you're going to have, are you going to work with other people in life? It's hard to avoid humans, they're all over the place. Yeah. And so if we're going to do business, if we're going to do work, what do I do? How am I going to reframe a difficult colleague? Yeah. You will have them. At the University of Utah, we never have, no, <laughs> you, you have a difficult colleague. So when they come along, if you reframe it and say, well, it's my opportunity to, to work with this person and get something positive out of this instead of just now being in this resistance position. Now, it doesn't mean it's not hard. It doesn't mean you don't have a lot of problem solving to do, but um, reframing the stressors that come along and also seeing them as growth opportunities. Mm-hmm. So back to that idea of resistance promotes strength or growth. And that is that, you know, you if you're going to go into any, unless you take a really low level basic job, you're going to have a lot of challenges as you try to move along in your career. Yeah. Now, one of the biggest challenges of a low level, low paying job is you can get your dispensable. So you can get fired quickly. So don't forget that. But let's say you have chosen a career, chosen a profession that, that you want to excel at, you're going to come across these stressors that come along. And if you see them as growth opportunities, learning opportunities, if you step back from a difficult situation and take a few notes, what did I get out of that? Where did I get my butt kicked on that? Mm-hmm. Like I was not prepared. I can actually think, and I won't overshare, but I can think of a recent situation where, where I had to step back and say, wow, I really failed <laughs> on, on this particular thing. And, 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 and how can I make sure it doesn't stay as a failure? How can I learn from that so that that doesn't happen to me again? And I actually had to sit down and take notes, and I recommend people do that. Yeah. So by accepting the fact that change is coming, uh, stressors come, and if you reframe them, you realize, hey, I've got this toolbox of personal skills, strengths, attitudes. Maybe it's something very specific like the grounding technique we talked about. Mm-hmm. Maybe it's just a self-knowledge of who you are and what your abilities are. Mm-hmm. If you can take that with you to the challenges that come and reframe them, I, I think that's how you survive and thrive yeah. in these difficult difficult world that we live in. Now I, so, yeah, this, this is probably all bonus time right now. But there's there's something, and you can kind of help, help me understand the I think there's sim- similar to what we've been talking about. But one thing I try to encourage, like some of our our advisors here, is if they're you know because a number of them say, well, I'm an introvert and I don't connect with everybody, and it's 
And I said, you know, that's that's not true. That's what you tell yourself. Doesn't mean that it's mm -hmm. you know that it's absolutely true and it can't change. Uh, but looking looking at what I've done in the past is whenever whenever I face something that makes me afraid, I just do it. Yeah. And and I try to do things What's every that old day. Book, feel the fear and do it anyway. Yeah. Right? And and it's more of like it's even something that may have it doesn't have anything to do with anything, right? Which is go up and just talk to a stranger or go and you know do do something that is just completely outside of your you know, your mo, mm -hmm. right? And so doing that, what how do you think does that does that play any part in being able to deal with difficult circumstances? If you maybe have a trigger that you know if something makes you afraid you're like yeah. Ugh, that you just go and do it or try it like go public speak go to toast toastmasters or or you know i don't know i don't know what i'm trying to say but it's Not like you know do do yeah. you know do a facebook live everybody i mean i think that people have like this natural fear of public speaking yes right it's huge. go do a facebook live I mean, yeah you're, you're public speaking right like do you have someone doing Talk to that? someone in an elevator I, exactly yeah. so what how does that play in doing oh, things huge. that you're afraid of like yeah. how does it play in and how does it maybe help when it comes to addressing situations that are most likely inevitable, those fearful situations. Yeah, no, absolutely. I, I would say a good visual on that is if you think about kind of, a, we use the term comfort zone. So think of a big circle around you mm -hmm. and you can easily say, well, what's in my comfort zone? And you, you, you can visualize what's in that comfort zone. Yeah. But what you need to realize is as we get older, there's an interesting developmental thing that happens that frankly contributes to things like midlife crises. And that is we stop pushing that zone wider and wider and wider. When you're young, you're, a, you're an adolescent, you're a young 20-something, you, the world's new, you're having new experiences, you're seeking new things, so you kind of push the boundaries. Hey, I want to read this, I want to do that, I want to go here, I want to try this. And so really, you, if you think about that comfort zone as, a, as an expandable or contractible thing, you're expanding it and expanding. But then at some point, around in our 30s to 40s, we start to get a little more safe, a little bit more safe. Mm -hmm. And you feel it in your bones. You kind of feel it in your in your thoughts. And and we 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 don't realize it, but that comfort zone can start to shrink a little bit and shrink yeah. a little bit. And maybe we've used certain skills to get us to where we're at, but we never developed a skill like public speaking. Or you know, uh, some people say, "Well, I'm introvert," so maybe they relied heavily on on intellectual cognitive abilities. Yeah. But their interpersonal abilities. They never really push yeah, back. They try on. to make up for it. Yeah, somewhere else. <laughs> right. And then they realize they've met all the success with that other skill, that intellectual <laughs> skill, yeah. and now there's a void. Now yeah. there's a deficit. Awesome. Could be in their business even. Sometimes you need to. I'm thinking of an attorney that I've worked with recently who, you know, that he he will never take it to the next level if he doesn't work on that interpersonal stuff. But he's mm -hmm. a brilliant guy. Mm -hmm. Of course, we can think of it in relationships. Yeah. So actually, if you if you do that visual and you think, well, what's just barely on the outside? of my comfort zone now. So we we visualize what's inside. What's on the outside? Huh? I don't mean a, a hundred yards away, but just a, a foot or two, a few steps away. Yeah. What what are those things? And that's where you make a commitment to action. Yeah. It's like, you know what? If I was 22, I'd probably go do that. Yeah. And so, you know what? I'm going to go do that. Go do it. I'm going to do it maybe yeah. on a small scale. Yeah. Maybe I'll do it step by step. Maybe I'm not ready to stand up on a stage in front of a thousand people. <laughs> but you know what? I can turn to the person in the elevator and chat them up for the 20 seconds we're on the elevator together, yeah. right? Or I can do a Facebook Live. Or there's a variety of things that yeah. we can do. But if you, that's a great visual, I think. It's very motivating. It makes things real by thinking, what's just a step or two outside that? And it can be in any context. It could be in my social life, my professional life, yeah. or just life in general. And then you set a goal to do that. Yeah. Do it in small ways and push that comfort zone wider like you used to do when you were younger. Yeah. Well, that's what's fascinating. So I have, I have a, so a, th a three-year-old and then I have a 10-year-old and a 12-year-old. And, and if you look at like a three-year-old, right, they, they don't, they, they're, they're not aware. I mean, they're aware of society, but they're not aware not, of, of not judgment. The, they're not yeah. aware. I mean, so, so he, you know, he'll, he'll yell and scream in the middle of, you know, in a, in a public room, right? Sure. Um, but then I, like my 12 year old, my 12 year old, I remember she, growing up, like whenever somebody asked a question, like anywhere, she, she just raised her hand yeah. and she didn't know what the answer was. Like she's like, well, you know, but Ready now to participate exactly. And she was, you know, she was amazing, but she doesn't do that anymore. And it, you know, society kind of, and I, I've, 
um, we had awesome com- conversations, and so she's you know she un- she understands now. But uh, you know she she looked at like how people viewed her and they judged and they made fun of her, and and it's like like Hannah, yeah. it's like doesn't and because it's again it goes to like the conversation of it doesn't it doesn't matter like why do you think they said it like doesn't well why did why did that what do you think they meant like why why did they have to say that or do that or do that and it all it all breaks down to you know the fact that it doesn't it doesn't matter right especially to her and who she is and what she means and her level of significance and it's it's fascinating because i think you're right i mean we we as human beings i don't know what age it occurs there's probably all sorts of studies but you know as you get older you start to conform and the grooves in that comfort zone are so are so deep yeah. and the deeper they get the harder it is to kind of push to push out because oh, yeah. you see all sorts of anxieties that, that people have that it's like that who cares who, why are you afraid of that right. right but it's it's really you look at what they are and i think you know if you can reframe that trigger to say don't be afraid of it use it as like wow that use it as a, a challenge because yeah. i think another part of human nature is we want to be challenged Oh, right, yeah. we want to push push limits. So I think grow. as it mm-hmm. yeah, so as it comes to money, as it comes to business, as it really comes to anything, okay, I think all of these principles apply to an extent. But specifically, as we're talking about money today, it's one of those things where you know, right now we live in a society where so many amazing things are going on. There's so much information. Mm-hmm. The difference between you know this person, you know, just a regular average Joe and Warren Buffett, it's not access to information. Right, it's not access to people either. You have access to tons and tons of people these days. Yeah. Okay, it is. It's the way in which you view opportunities, way in which you view the world, way in which you view your uh, your uh, relationships. Oh, right, yeah. it goes all through. And I would say physical, but Warren Buffett drinks like five cokes a day or something <laughs> like that. So I'll throw that out the window. Yeah, yeah. But my my point is, is, like, yeah, I think a lot of the principles we've been talking about in the last two podcasts are, you know, they're a part of really every aspect of of life. But when it comes to finances. Yeah, I mean, there's these days there aren't there really aren't many excuses to not do really to do really well. Yeah. And I would say just along those lines really quickly, um, you know, if you if you think about developmentally when you were younger, maybe late teens, early 20s, and you had certain financial goals and it doesn't matter how big those are. But let's say you've gone after them and you've met them or most of them, which most of us have. I mean, you know, some of those basic goals that we had when we were just starting out and just coming up. Right. And then it's the psychology of what do I do with that? Some people are fear based, like we've talked about, Mm -hmm. and they just want to maintain. And that's where that that comfort zone starts to shrink and shrink and shrink because we're just trying to maintain. We're just trying to maintain. Mm -hmm. But if people see um, the skills that got them there, so that that ability to go after things, the ability to work hard, that um, just the pleasure of reaching, setting and reaching a goal. And if you are somewhere in whatever you consider your midlife, maybe you're you you've met a lot of those goals. You're at a you're at a high risk category mm-hmm. because that's a time where we can we can uh, forget the skills that got us to where we are. But you're right because of the environment we live in, and it's, and it's different than it was 20 years ago or 50 years ago or 100 mm-hmm. years ago. What the the opportunities, the the communication skills, the ability to connect with others, we can take those same skills that got us to wherever we're at at this point in our lives and if we're willing to kind of think about that comfort zone and push it back we can take those same skills and go even further not for not for the sake of having more Mm -hmm. but really I think like you said I'm paraphrasing you doing more like we Mm want to be challenged and the pleasure that comes from being uh, successful Mm -hmm. in however you define that and I, I think that that's where the psychology of business and money really comes into at a personal level yep awesome well we're getting the proverbial hook okay <laughs> we talked about way too and i didn't even get into some of the questions that i had so part three ha- I, I smell part three let's do i smell it i smell it too so all right well we'll do part three in the next uh next little bit but thank you guys so much for those of you who are live on facebook thank you uh but also those that are, that are listening hope you enjoyed the show uh, we'll have uh, Matt's contact information on our show notes. You can reach out to him and follow him and follow his Facebook lives. Yes. Are, are you doing it? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't yet. This is my first Facebook live, but what let's do you think? Do it it's, again. Not, it's not yeah. as stressful as you thought. No, it isn't. And I talk a lot every day. Anyway, I know. So. <laughs>
It's just a different type. Yeah, anyways. All right. Well, that's uh, that's it for today. Thanks everyone for uh, for tuning in, and we will see you uh, see you next week. You've been listening to the Wealth Standard Podcast, the gold standard in all things financial. 